Hello and welcome everyone. Can people hear me in general? Anyway, Wilma, you'll let me know if uh, if my voice is not appearing. Um, I'll rely on you. Um, You're heard. Brilliant, thank you. So we have some really interesting speakers coming up. Uh, we're going to try and keep it um, rapid. So we'll have five minutes from each speaker, followed by a five minute uh, question and answer. And then at the end, we'll have an open uh, question and answer session uh, for everyone to be in dialogue. So please, as you listen, do think about questions, interact with us, let us know. Even if you don't have a question, what you're thinking, feel free to uh, applaud and cheer the speakers as they go uh, in the chat box as well. Um, so we're going to start off uh, with Paulina Schiappetasse. How did I do that, Paulina? You can correct me in a moment. Um, uh, who's from the, our EU, uh, Transurban EU China project. And she's been looking at this um, subject of land policy uh, in Europe and in China and um, trying to analyze where where well where both sides can improve but especially where Europe can help um, China rethink its policy and um, then we'll hear from Alfredo uh, Corbalan who is doing land policy in Brussels um, and he's going to share some of his own insights uh, working at city level um, and then we'll hear from Dohi Downey uh, who's also working on land, land policy at city level uh, in Dublin, where I actually find myself by coincidence uh, these days. So thank you all for joining us. I'm sure that uh, more people will be popping in, but I don't want to delay any further. Um, so Paulina, please uh, take it away. Okay, Anthony, thank you. I'm not so familiar with this program, so I will appreciate if you can um, share my presentation. Yes, just um, starting to share my screen now, so it should appear any moment. Thank you. Maybe it might take about 30 seconds. You can just tell us again uh, uh, who you are and if I got your second name uh, well there. So I'm just opening this up now, um, Paulina. Did I manage your second name okay? Can you say it for me? I cannot hear you so well. Ah, okay. Well, I can hear you at least. Um, so you should now be able to see your slides, can you? Yes. Fantastic. But I cannot open my file. Oh, I, I have your slides up on the screen, so hopefully everyone can see them. Wilma, do they seem to be appearing for everyone or for yes. you? Yes. Okay, brilliant. So you can just tell me when you want me to uh, plop ahead on the slides. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation and uh, for giving me the possibility to present uh, some of the preliminary results um, in our work package land use planning and land uh, management concerning especially to the issue of urban expansion areas in Europe. Can you go to the next one? Yes, and I would like to start this uh, presentation with, with this very interesting uh, graph where you can see the situation of urban sprawl in Europe between the year 2000 and 2006. And in the red um, bar, you can see the extension of economic sites and infrastructures, while in the blue one, the urban uh, residential sprawl. So we can see that most uh, all countries uh, are affected by that, especially the European suburban areas. And uh, it is a major challenge. Even the European uh, Environmental uh, Agency uh, name it an uh, ignore challenge. But um, it's a major issue to tackle on the way to sustainable 
um, land uh, use in Europe. The next one, please. The next one. Is that appearing for you, Paulina? The map is what you're looking yes. for? Yes. So um, there are many if effects associated to land sprawl or to land uh, extension, and I just want to mention some of them, especially one of the most important is the loss of agricultural land. And here in this map, you can see uh, the percentage in the same period that I, I show you in the um, other slide. And um, those uh, NATS2, this map is uh, at the NATS2 um, level in Europe, uh, that are with um, blue, um, they are experiencing the most important increase in this topic. Uh, although, and we will see later, all the measures that they have been taking up in the European Union, according to the, environmental, the European Environmental Agency, the land take in the, in the EU28 still amounted very hard, very high, uh, around 532 square kilometers per year. Yeah, if we can see the next one. Can you see that okay, Paulina? No, I cannot see the next one. I think there's just a slight lag, uh, uh, so it'll take a, a minute to maybe appear for you. But um, if, if you want to go ahead, I will try and keep us up with the slide. So this should be appearing shortly for you. Yeah, and in this one, uh, we are showing um, another very important issue. Actually, I cannot see completely, but uh, with the dots, you can see um, the major European cities and uh, the mean soil uh, ceiling in 2006. And this is a very interesting exercise because it is connected with um, a number of uh, nights, of tropical nights, during the summer between uh, the 60s and 1990, and those that they are projected for 2010-2040. Um, uh, so just to remind you, the number of tropical, uh, tropical night is a night where the minimum temperature is equal to 20 or over 20 degrees. And we can see that the situation will be especially, um, I would say, dramatic in the south of uh, Europe. The next one, please. Well, as, as I said before, the European uh, Union, since more than uh, 20 years, is um, trying to tackle the issue of urban sprawl. And in this slide, we should uh, see in some moment the different um, activities that have been uh, conducted to uh, tackle this issue. So. Um, we are talking about the Leipzig Charter, the um, uh, Anthony, I cannot see it. This is the slide with um, measures to control sprawl at the top? Or policies and programs addressing urban sprawl? Um, can, can you hear me okay, Paulina? Yes, I yeah. can. Okay, so it's you're looking. You, the slide is policies and programs addressing urban sprawl in the EU. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, and you were just at Leipzig Charter. So that's what I've got up on my screen. Can you see anything at the moment? No. 
No, but you have the presentation. Um, I mean, you have your own presentation. So maybe if yes, if, I have it. Okay. If you just follow this your own true. presentation, and then I'll try to keep us up on on uh, on the. Okay. So the, the different policies and programs that they have been addressing urban sprawl in, in, in the European Union, they started at the end of the 90s uh, with the special development perspective. Then it was a very important contribution, the European Landscape uh, Convention, the Leipzig Charter, very important for cities because it's uh, definitely providing guidelines for sustainable development the Declaration of Toledo, the Roadmap to a Resource Efficient Europe, and finally, the Territorial Agenda. So these have, these have been the guidelines provided by Europe, by the European Union, but of course, uh, the different countries and uh, as well regions, they uh, use different measures as well to try to control sprawl. And the measures to control a scroll are divided between uh, those that are called traditional, the old measures, so where we have a land use zoning and the prohibition to, to, to start a, an urban development like the green bells or the protection of rural land, especially used in the UK, um, urban re revitalization through taxes, planning or special agency. They have been the traditional measures to control sprawl, but as well uh, in the discussion we talk about the new approaches, and these are connected with regional planning agencies, uh, a, a new approach to urban revitalization that is oriented to improve the attractiveness of inner areas, restricted planning rules, urban boundaries, setting target limits and benchmarks, and reducing, for instance, municipal dependency on land local taxes, or even the change of size and functions of uh, local governments. In some cases, they have worked uh, pretty well, while in others, uh, we cannot say uh, the same. Even the green belts, for instance, they have uh, worked uh, very uh, good in the case of the UK, but they didn't have uh, the expected results, for instance, in Germany. Concerning the national level in Europe, uh, there are as well uh, many different approaches, and I would like to highlight uh, two of them. So the Swiss uh, Spatial Planning Act is an act that is very similar to the German and to the um, uh, Austrian approach that the expansion of urban areas is only possible if an evaluation demonstrates that there is a need in, um, uh, in uh, urban expansion. And as well, uh, although I have not seen any official um, uh, report about um, the success of this measure, the German National Sustainable Development Strategy that uh, it was um, implemented in 2007, and it was expected that by this year, um, the land take for new housing and infrastructure development shall not exceed the 30 areas per day. Um, in the local level as well, uh, Europe has, and I'm talking about the neighborhood level, that this is the objective of our uh, project, um, Europe has a long tradition in planning urban expansion areas due to the um, um, housing shortage after the war, for instance, or to environmental pro uh, problems during the beginning of the 20th century. We are talking about the garden cities, the British new towns, the French new, the Swedish million program, and the Dutch and the German housing estates. Of course, there were a lot of uh, negative uh, issues connected to social aspects in these uh, large housing states that they have definitely been addressed by the new approaches. So as, as, as we can see, um, planning urban extension areas has, uh, has been always an alternative not only to control a sprawl, but as well to solve the problem of housing needs and to improve the quality of life, additional as well to test, in many cases, new technologies. These approaches um, have a global reach, and they are especially attractive for world regions with a fast-growing 
urbanization rates like Asia and especially in China. Here I would like to make a link with our project. It's uh, called Transurban EU China and uh, we are interested in to research about the transition towards urban sustainability through what we call the social, the social integrative city in the EU and in China. The objective of this uh, project is, is to help policymakers, urban authorities, real estate developers, public services providers and citizens in China to create social integrative cities in an environmentally friendly and financial way. Particularly, um, my um, area of, of research is to identify these tools and measures or approaches that can support uh, the transformation, this urban transformation, in cooperation with stakeholders and citizens. So in other words, what has worked in Europe and uh, how this can be uh, transferred uh, to Chinese uh, cities. In terms of uh, a methodological perspective, we made a, a scanning of um, the literature on uh, good practices on urban extension areas. I don't know if you can see the table, but there are um, many examples in Europe in different uh, countries concerning um, this kind of uh, um, development that uh, they have been, as I said, very positive in terms of uh, social integration. So the, 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 the first result of our scan uh, was related to um, a, a first classification of the different types of uh, planned urban expansion that exist in Europe. We are talking about urban infill. You can see, I hope, in the schematic uh, representation that C is um, showing the city center, S is um, addressing the suburban areas, and R the rural land. So the urban infill are all these new developments that they are um, implemented on vacant land or under development land within an existing area. Then we have the new towns or settlements. These are very um, exceptional, I would say, uh, developments because it's a matter of a space in Europe. And um, this classification is targeting these uh, freestanding plan settlements promoted either by private or public uh, sector. And finally, that this, is, uh, this was um, the objective of uh, our analysis. There are what we call the urban extension areas or the new districts, that these are plan extension, that they are connected with an already existing city or town. We have chosen, uh, based on the, on the literature available, to, can, um, to make a further and intensive analysis of the cases, three cases in, of, in Europe uh, that they are internationally, I can say, recognized as good practices. The first one is uh, Rieselfeld in uh, Freiburg in uh, Germany. Freiburg is a, it's, um, it's an example, a, a world example concerning uh, their energy uh, policy. North um, Upton, Northampton in um, England, and finally um, Battles in Amersfoort in, in the Netherlands. We have um, analyzed these cases very deeply concerning their contribution to the improvement of uh, social integration. I hope that you can see the table and in the first column um, I uh, wrote the characteristic of a socially integrative city that we uh, develop within the project in a, in a special group uh, oriented for that. So you can see, for instance, uh, how the three cases have uh, contributed to reduce the sprawl, to promote a well-balanced land conversion, and uh, how to access to urban uh, land. That is a very important issue, especially concerning housing affordability. So the characteristic of the socially integrative uh, city that we have identified are 12, and um, we uh, identify, as I said, the um, tools and approaches 
that they have contributed to fulfill these objectives. So the characteri characteristics are related to um, to uh, urban planning and design, to urban environment, to local economy and markets, and to the social and cultural development and social capital, and finally to the institutional setting and urban finance. One of the preliminary results that you can see, we have classified the tools uh, promoting uh, social integration. We have uh, development plans, the visioning is very important and then the specific management instruments. And finally, um, we call this category development initiatives uh, that uh, are coming up either from citizens, from the governments, or from the private sector. In this table, we can see that uh, we have identified 12 um, different uh, types of development uh, plans that they have uh, work in these cases and they go from housing action plans, regeneration agencies, uh, land planning guidelines to industrial and commercial approaches. Concerning the um, management instruments, we have identified 14 and um, some of them are a very wise local transportation uh, plan, the establishment of a working group, or joint venture companies. And finally, the initiatives, um, we have identified seven, and they are mainly connected with um, uh, marketing issues or with activities oriented to promote the identification, the cohesion of the whole area. Um, finally, um, I would like to share with you that we are now in the process of development of the development of the of an online compendium. So, in this compendium, we are going to um, describe each of the tools that uh, have contributed to um, social um, integration. So uh, this compendium, as I said, will be online, and um, this is the um, uh, design uh, or the future design of the web page, so where we will um, describe the purpose of the tool, um, the potential impact of it, the strengths, the weaknesses. So we will uh, provide two uh, good practice examples on the tool, uh, and then additional um, insights from the study uh, material. So, and uh, of course, some of the pictures uh, that um, are associated to the area. And here, for instance, I would like to show the picture of um, the district research fell in uh, Freiburg. This was a former sewage area that uh, belongs to the city of uh, Freiburg and in, in a very a comprehensive planning uh, process, um, this um, district was um, uh, implemented already uh, in 2010 with very good uh, results. For instance, you can see here, Freiburg is characterized by a high building diversity, so you don't have this homogeneous housing structure. I mean, they have as well uh, develop a district meeting center for um, projects associated to the young population, and finally a very interesting model con connected to um, an ecum ecumenical uh, church where the different uh, religions uh, share this space. Further steps, and with this I would like to finish my presentation, is to uh, test these uh, tools um, to see the probability uh, to transfer uh, them uh, to China and the other way around too. So the Chinese uh, colleagues are doing the same exercise and we will see as well um, the possibilities to share their results and improve the good practices in Europe. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm sorry for all the technical problems. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Paulina. So, um, lots of stuff there, and I guess that some questions will be coming in on the left. Uh, so, we will pick those 
up uh, in a moment. Uh, maybe just a first question for you, uh, Paulina, while we collect those. Um, you mentioned there at the end the possibilities of creating this replication uh, in the EU and in China, or rather taking the European tools tools and working them in China, uh, we know that that can be challenging at best. Uh, can you tell me uh, what the likelihood of, is of, of this being successful? I could not hear the last one. Can you repeat, please? Sure. I'm just wondering about re replicating in China and how these tools are going to work in that context. I mean, will that are there specific tools that we have for this or...? Okay, thank you. Thank you for this uh, question. So replication is uh, it's always a very uh, complicated uh, issue. So especially concerning the European Union and China, where the, the settings, the institutional settings, the, the, uh, the political, economic and social uh, aspects are uh, totally different. Nevertheless, we consider uh, this possibility um, within the, the project, and we are planning to test uh, some of these tools that I have uh, uh, presented to you in, um, in uh, open uh, seminars with uh, Chinese stakeholders. So, therefore, we would like to, to see their reaction, and of course, um, not only to the tool as well, the, the, the possibility to implement them in different settings. Okay, interesting. I have an, uh, one qu more question that I want to get to, although we do have to probably move to the other speakers. But um, b before I do move ahead, let's just take one question um, from someone who's listening in. Maybe Wilma, do you want to share with us the question of um, Aphrodite? Yes. Uh, so Aphrodite was, uh, it's, is in Vancouver. She has worked with the Saloniki before, and she's asking if there are any examples or mechanisms for addressing social infrastructure, um, since land use and real estate is usually a residential or commercial, uh, and how do cities ensure affordable land or property for social infrastructure? Uh, is it owned by a municipality or non-profits? Um, and that's it. Oh, uh, thank you for, for this question, but I, I could not uh, hear. It's very it's 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 very complicated. My uh, connection, it seems. Can you please um, repeat it? Sure. Uh, so the question is actually. Um, a twofold. Uh, are there any examples or mechanisms for addressing social infrastructure? Uh, and how do cities ensure affordable land property for social infrastructure? Okay, regarding the infrastructure, um, we have not dealt with this specific issue uh, within uh, the project. Um, it's one of the characteristics of the social integrative city, but it's more connected with the social uh, and economic infrastructure in terms of promoting uh, social integration. As I was uh, talking, you know, uh, I showed some examples uh, concerning the uh, uh, local transportation plan that is very crucial in urban extension areas, not to leave them isolated, so to have a very um, appropriate connection with the center of the city and with the, the rest of the of the region on one hand. And concerning the land property, uh, can you repeat? I just got it. Land property. Sure. Um, it's uh, it asks uh, for the land property if it's um, how to ensure it for social infrastructure, meaning is it owned by the municipality or some non-profits? How does that work? Oh, I got it. So, in terms of the land property, uh, the three examples I, I, I show or I share to you are uh, totally different. Uh, for instance, um, in the case of uh, Freiburg, um, the, the site was property of, a city, of the city, and as I said, it was a sewage uh, former plant. And they have um, they have promoted the um, recovery of this site. So when it was recovered, 
uh, the city invest uh, in the social, uh, in the basic infrastructure, and then decides where associated to different uh, developers uh, to promote this building diversity. This is um, a similar uh, approach to what uh, it has been used in the Netherlands. So to go for these areas um, that are close to the cities, but they are definitely um, um, with polluted soils. So to try to recover these soils. In the case of the Netherlands, uh, I mean the city was uh, buying uh, uh, these uh, different plots and um, as well invest in, in making their own investment in the uh, social infrastructure. And the UK, as always, they have a total different uh, approach. They have a, a regional and, um, and a national agency for urban regeneration where they are in charge of assembling land. So in some kind of, uh, let's say, working group, they work together with the different municipalities and uh, as well, you know, to uh, provide uh, land uh, property in much more cheaper ways. As, as a general sentence, I, I can say that this is one of the most important differences with China. I mean, in Europe, the local governments are highly, highly, highly incorporated in the issues of land assembly and land uh, property in these successful cases that I have presented. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so we have another question from um, Alfredo Corbalan, but as he's our next speaker and, and we need to hear from two more speakers uh, this morning, um, I'm going to just switch over to him. So I'll ask him to give um, his presentation relating to the best practices uh, or, or practices in general uh, at ground level in Brussels on this um, topic. So uh, uh, and then maybe we can get to the point that we, he can ask his question uh, uh, as well and we can create more dialogue between uh, our speakers. So, uh, Alfredo, are you there and can you hear me? Yes, good morning, Anthony. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. I'm going to start sharing your presentation. Uh, I can share it myself. It's easier, maybe. Yes, perfect. Because I can... Oh, uh, I'll try. So, good morning, um, every everybody. Uh, so, I will... Uh... Uh, just a second, and um, it's chart. It's it's loading. <laughs> yep, great. And uh, meanwhile, I'll just remind everyone here that they're free to ask questions at any point in the chat box on the left, and it doesn't have to be a question either. They can just comment. They can just say how well everyone is looking this morning, or whatever they want to uh, input. They're welcome to at any point. So please keep that in active space. Um, so it's charging. So yeah, I will start presenting. So first of all, thank you, uh, uh, Anthony. Thank you to Eurocity for the invitation to participate to this webinar. Uh, I'm um, Alfredo Corbelan. Um, I'm working for the Brussels Capital Region. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm uh, in charge uh, of uh, more exactly. I'm working for this uh, urban special planning agency uh, of the Brussels Capital Region, where I'm in charge of uh, international, European, and interregional uh, cooperation project. And um, and yet yeah, our um, just it's it's taking quite time <laughs> to load. Uh, I don't know why. Um, usually it's working pretty good, but... Uh, Can I suggest rather than uploading it, you try sharing your screen? That's the method I've been using. I find it... Um... Yeah, that's what I, I have been trying to... Ah, you're sure. Okay, uh, pardon me. Um... Yeah, I, I, yeah, I try to share, but... Uh... I'll uh, let me take it and I'll uh, I'll put it on my on my screen. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Okay, super. Uh, so I don't know how to stop it. <laughs> can okay. you can you? It should be um. Okay, you, I should you be started. Okay, using my power to override your. Uh... 
All right. <laughs> So yeah, I, uh, yeah. Usually, it's it's working pretty well. Uh, so with it's the sky. up on my screen. I don't know if everyone can see it. Wilma, can you see it? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so it, maybe you'll have a lag as well, uh, Alfredo, as Paulina did. But um, if you go ahead and present, I'll just keep up with you. Okay, because I don't see anything. <laughs> I have perspective Brussels on the screen, and Wilma Wilma tells me that it's visible. So. Okay, all right. So it is visible. I will do it without seeing anything, which is a bit uh, <laughs> difficult. Uh, well, I suggest because uh, Paulina had the same issue. So I suggest if you follow the presentation on your own computer, and yeah, I'll I will. I will do that. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So I will. Uh, I will follow on my own computer. Super. Uh, so yeah. So. Um, yeah, perspective Brussels is a bit to, to to link with the previous uh, speaker. Yes, we are uh, this kind of tool, um, um, urban planning agency uh, that was created uh, in 2016 uh, by uh, the regional authority in order to gather in one in one on um, agency uh, different uh, disciplinary uh, going from the uh, uh, statistic uh, institute to knowledge uh, departments. Uh, and uh, also uh, um, special and uh, strategic planning, uh, together with also regional architect. So in order to have, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, agency where uh, you can um, better know the city of today to plan better the city of tomorrow, to, to make it shortly. And so uh, that's the perspective, Russell, in, in a nutshell. Uh, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, Brussels is located in um, in the uh, in the northwest uh, Europe. Um, you can see in northwest Europe. Uh, uh, it's a very dense uh, area made of different metropolises interconnected, uh, 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 like uh, the, for Brussels, Antwerp uh, in. Um, in, uh, in in Belgium, uh, Amsterdam and Rotterdam in the Netherlands, the Ruhr and, um, and Cologne in, in Germany, and Lille in, in, in France. So altogether, this uh, big uh, agglomeration of metropolis, it's a, a, around 50 million inhabitants. Uh, next uh, slide, I have a map. No, you, normally, I have a map on, of Belgium uh, on the first slide as well. So. Um, so Brussels is the capital of Belgium. Um, Belgium is a federal state, uh, so there are three regions. Uh, in on blue north, it's uh, Flanders region. On red on south, it's a uh, Wallonia region. And in the middle, the the ten, tiny dot, it's a Brussels capital region. Uh, what is important to know uh, concerning uh, what we are talking today is in Belgium uh, special. Uh, uh, policy, land use policy, housing policy, and also public transport policy are a matter uh, which where the region are competent. Uh, the national level has no competency in, in on these uh, policies, so the region are free to adopt their own policy, to adopt their own tools, and uh, develop the strategy they want on their own territory. So that's something very important. Um, to, to, to know for, for or as part of the context. Uh, so uh, I don't know if we are still on the on the same slide, which is slide three. That we, we have we see the region of Brussels with the border. Uh, you can see uh, that Brussels is a t uh, urban uh, uh, region. We have some uh, 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 farmland on the west part. Some also uh, forests on the south part and, and big parks, uh, but we are mainly uh, um, urban and we are composed of 19 municipalities. Uh, next slide, please, that should be Brussels in figure, if it's correct. Uh, yes, so we, uh, our population is 1.2 million inhabitants uh, registered, but uh, as you can see, we also have uh, big uh, commuting flows because more or less Almost uh, half a million of people are coming every day uh, from outside Brussels to Brussels to work or to study. Um, 
in terms of uh, density, uh, we have quite a disparity of density between more central neighborhoods with uh, higher density. You can see the figures, and uh, and uh, more uh, neighborhoods on the on the more outskirt area of uh, the region with very low density. Next slide, please. Uh, we should see the land. Um, uh, land. Concerning land use, mm -hmm. um, you have some comparison with Paris and Amsterdam. We are quite small. Uh, the territory is 162 kilometers square, so quite small territory. Um, uh, almost 53% uh, is non-built, green area or, or, or water, and 47% uh, is the built-up area. Uh, in this 162 kilometers square, so we, I said 1.2 million inhabitants, uh, we face for, uh, let's say, for, uh, for European standards, uh, um, a big growth of population the last 20 years. We went from, uh, from um, a city losing inhabitants in the 80s and 90s to a city with a growth of inhabitants in the last 20 years, in total 20% of new inhabitants. Uh, the forecast for the next 20 years are uh, uh, still to increase, but uh, at uh, less speed, uh, with a total amount of 6% of uh, new uh, inhabitants in the next 20 years. So this, uh, let's say, uh, demographic boom was a reason uh, to develop a new strategic uh, plan for, for the region. Next slide, please. That uh, this strategic plan was started uh, a few years ago, and it was finally adopted by the uh, uh, government, uh, regional government, two years ago in July 2018. It's the uh, strategic plan for the region, uh, mid and long term. Uh, it's not a binding document, uh, so by law, but it's a document important because. In, it developed the, the, the vision of the, of the city, the vision of the public authority. It gives the framework uh, uh, that all the, for instance, the different thematic plan have to take into account. If we take the mobility plan or the uh, environmental plan, it uh, has to be uh, in accordance or taking into account the main strategies. Next slides, please. Um, there are some principles, of course, you can see them. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just uh, take one, which is important relating to the topic of um, how do we see the urbanization. Uh, it's the um, multi-scale and polycentricity. Uh, what we want to do with that, it's uh, we would like to, to develop uh, more um, the city of uh, short distances. What does it mean? We want to focus on neighborhood in order to provide at neighborhood level all the uh, public amenities uh, of needed for the population. Uh, we are speaking about uh, sport facility, cultural facility, health facilities, uh, access to public services, but also a uh, public transport node and, and, and so uh, green areas uh, in order to, to give the possibility of of the inhabitants to have everything close to their home and and to provide uh, to, um, to try to uh, to uh, for them not to 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 have to do uh, uh, to travel for unnecessary, unnecessary reasons. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there are four priority in the in the plan. I will not go deep on them. If you want, I can develop during the question time. Um, with the, the the reason behind was uh, we only have 162 kilometers square. Uh, the city cannot expand beyond the administrative limits uh, because then we are in another region with other regulation. So how do we? Uh, do we use the land more efficiently in order to accommodate the new inhabitant and the future new inhabitants? So that was the main area. We use the land on the best way possible. Uh, for first priority, to, to develop housing, uh, because uh, like in a lot of, of um, cities, big cities around the world, there is a, a lack of affordable uh, uh, there is a lack of, of affordable housing. Um, uh, not only for more deprived uh, citizens, but also for middle-class citizens. 
Um, and th th for that purpose, there is a creation of new uh, mixed-use district uh, plan. Uh, second priority, how do we keep a quality of life uh, despite of the need maybe to, uh, in, uh, to densify some area? Um, and that is very much related as well with um, uh, with the uh, uh, urban regeneration of the of the of the historical and more deprived areas, uh, with a new way of of uh, making this urban regeneration, also the protection of environment of uh, of um, or, and the development as well of uh, uh, urban uh, farming, for instance, or a circular economy. Uh, the third priority is uh, um, urban uh, related to economy. Of course, we want to keep being an international city. We want to keep being a city uh, uh, very much into the service and knowledge society. But, uh, which is quite new, we want also to be a productive city, keep uh, producing things in Brussels and not only services. And that I will like, show you an example at the, at the end of my presentation of how do we do that. And finally, uh, mobility. Uh, uh, the clear message of the plan is to shift uh, uh, to uh, more uh, eco-friendly uh, and more active uh, mobility pattern and to reduce the use of private car in the city. Uh, for all that, of course, we, we need uh, some uh, tools, some policies, uh, or some uh, way of uh, uh, governance. Uh, uh, Talking with uh, our neighbor region, talking with the inhabitants, uh, talking with the municipality, and uh, to finish, uh, I will in the last slide uh, I will show you this slide show the the different uh, the 60 priority development zone uh, for the development of of, of Brussels. Uh, this zone are um, the zone that are important uh, uh, to uh, to implement the the four thematic and to develop uh, some zones they are very different some are former uh, brownfield other zones are uh, for um, zones which are actually uh, monofunctional for offices uh, and other zones are zones that need to have a more um, work uh, concerning uh, urban regeneration so they are, they are very different um, the first one i want to talk is the canal zone with the arrow in the middle uh, the canal zone, uh, it's, um, uh, it's used uh, to be the industrial area of, uh, of Brussels during the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century till the mid of 20th centuries. So it's uh, an area uh, which has a past of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, production, of industrial production, also an area that welcome uh, the newcomers and immigrants uh, for, for years. And what we want to do uh, uh, there is to, to develop, of course, housing, but to keep a mixity of uh, social uh, diversity. We don't want, um, uh, we want uh, to different kind of people to keep living there uh, who don't want to avoid gentrification and we also want to uh, uh, develop and redevelop a productive city uh, and productive uh, uh, economy uh, for making a uh, product and for that we adopt a canal plan a few years ago the regional government adopted a canal plan uh, which is not a master plan which is a flexible tool uh, with the aim to uh, all all projects developed there in this area have to be mixed, have to have an intensity of the use of the land, and have to be integrated in the in the in the context with a, a special attention to qualitative public space. That's why we also added recently um, a public space plan uh, in order to have a more uh, homogeneous uh, uh, public space in the area. And uh, that was for the canal zone and the, the idea to have the productive city. And the uh, last example is uh, the defense zone, uh, which is uh, um, an, an area uh, which is owned by the Ministry of Defense. The Ministry of Defense wanted to re, uh, to um, to redevelop the, this this uh, this area after the that's the it, Formerly, there were the part of the NATO in this area that move away, and so uh, the minister, uh, the, the the area is bit, is uh, across. Uh, one part is in Brussels and one part is in Flanders. 
so what we did, uh, despite the fact we don't have a metropolitan uh, cooperation uh, body to tackle the, the issue of uh, urban sprawl at a bigger metropolitan scale, uh, what we are developing now is cooperation based on projects on zone with our neighbor. Uh, regions. And so in this particular case, uh, with a colleague from Flanders, uh, um, we developed together uh, one master plan uh, for the two uh, regions um, that could be then implemented uh, by each region according to the process, to internal process. And uh, the master plan uh, was in in the Brussels part to, to be more urban with a mixed-use uh, yeah, and on the on the um, on the Flanders part to keep a more green areas and more farm in order to avoid urban sprawl. So um, that was a bit uh, quickly said uh, presentation about uh, how do we uh, our um, strategy in Brussels for urbanization. And that was great. Thank you very much, um, Alfredo. Really interesting. I have some questions of my own, and I see that we're getting some questions in the box as well. Um, however, I'm getting a little bit concerned about time because we had a few technical issues in the beginning which have pushed us forward. So I, what I think I'll do is, if Dohi is there, Dohi Downey, um, working in Dublin City on land policy, maybe we'll just go straight to him and then afterwards, if people, if some people are able to stick around, it would be great. We could have uh, one or two questions. Um, if people have to leave, don't worry, we will be putting a recording um, of this up online. So anyone that uh, misses the last tit tidbits will certainly be able to, uh, to um, get some insights that way and of course uh, it's always possible to contact our speakers directly as well if you want to email me um, about that. So thank you very much Alfredo and um, Dohi are you there? Ah well let me see You should be unmuted now so, Dohi, apparently you have sound, but I can't hear Hello? you. Ah, brilliant. Fantastic. Oh, okay. Right, here we go. We've got you. Good morning. Um, Anthony, may I ask you to put up the slides I sent you, and I'll work from your... Yes, uh, certainly. Your end. Oh, uh, I saw how happy right you <clears throat> you should be able to see that. Okay, good morning everybody and uh, thank you for your patience. Um, it's a nice morning here in Dublin. I hope you're enjoying the time uh, and the weather uh, as a, some form of respite from our current circumstances. So I'm going to spend a little bit of the time talking to you about some immediate issues facing the city of Dublin, in particular around the thematic that I've been asked to address about urban renewal and urban policy in relation to land. Um, if you could move on, please, Anthony. I want to talk about the strategic content that's facing the city of Dublin. I'm just going to quickly uh, move across some of the um, planning and strategic frameworks that the city is uh, is embedded within. Um, I want to particularly highlight the alignment that the city is attempting to undertake to, towards the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. And I'm introducing the specific issues of housing in terms of need and demand in Dublin, um, as it's a major, major issue in terms of the growth strategy for the city and its ability to maintain a sustainable form of development. At the moment, the city has a very substantive challenge in terms of meeting the uh, uh, supply side deficits in housing and ensuring that housing is both affordable and accessible and to the quality standard and in the right locations, all of the major issues that apply to most urban met metropolitan areas. But we have a particular land use strategy around the use of brownfield sites, which is emerging this year and last, and it will lead to some key decisions in terms of land use rezoning. And I'm going to then, then finish by looking at one particular housing-led urban renewal and regeneration in Dublin. Okay, so next slide, please, Anthony. Uh, there we go. Wow. 
No, that's not the next slide for me. The next slide is Dublin's strategic context for urban development. If you go back up a bit, please. Up again, please. So uh, I, slide. Think I think we're just moving at a there slightly different rate. So I have uh, the uh, okay. strategic context. Uh, okay. So it's slide three. After, that's it. The context. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, well, uh, this is an attempt at a snapshot to look at some of the very immediate uh, strategies and plans and various other instruments for uh, decision making that influence development and urban development in Dublin. Um, I don't intend to in any way address these in detail, but just to let you know that the, the ones that are most important to us at the moment, the ones that are most pressing perhaps, uh, are the National Development Plan. Uh, and the investment and capital investment monies that come forward through that. The national planning framework, these are all in the, the middle section of that uh, graphic there. Um, the regional spatial and economic strategy on the low, lower level and the key uh, decision making framework for the city which, which is its city development plan. Within that there's a housing strategy. Um, then there are a number of other statutory plans in relation to economy and community development uh, but we won't have time to go into them. Suffice to say that at any one point in time, uh, the hierarchy of these um, various instruments is not always stable. It does depend on the operational delivery um, of uh, service and um, investment underneath their uh, their objectives, uh, and that can change. And sometimes these uh, various strategies will compete with each other rather than become coherent. So this is one of the challenges around urban governance that's been uh, mentioned by Alfredo uh, about the importance of ensuring that there's a, an appropriate uh, form of governance to maintain coherence amongst these various strategies. Um, just to say a little bit about the national planning strategies um, that we operate within, the main purpose of the planning framework for uh, the country uh, is to consolidate urban growth within a compact uh, place, within, a, within a, the existing footprint. So exa the, for example, the city of Dublin Dublin now has a target of having at least 50% of all its new housing um, in its city and urban areas being developed and delivered within the existing built-up footprint. Uh, and the national planning framework requires the reuse of large and small brownfield land and infill sites. And uh, clearly those that are well served by existing planning and public transport. So Dublin has an orbital motorway system called the M50, which rings it um, north to south and north, west and south. We, and on the east, we have the sea, so the M50 doesn't go into that. Um, and it's within that context that the existing built up area of Dublin has to be reconsolidated. The second important strategic plan is the spatial and economic strategy for the region. And that has an additional set of targets, but one that's probably most significant is the population growth target increase for the city of Dublin, which is a minimum of 100,000 people in the next 10 years. So it has introduced a new metropolitan area strategic plan. Um, and again, the emphasis there is on locating development on existing and planned strategic transport corridors. And again, it's about anticipating the future growth of the city along these corridors and reusing existing land and developing brownfield sites. Um, so if you could move on please Anthony. So the next slide will uh, just mention the uh, alignment that the city is undertaking with the range of uh, 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And what we are attempting to do is auditing and assessing all of our strategic and statutory plans against the criteria required to measure what contribution uh, our strategies will make towards meeting these sustainable development goals. Um, as a matter of governance, this is beginning to make a very important contribution to um, the uh, development of coherence across a range of statutory uh, bodies involved in planning and development. Um, it's, it's reasonably new, you might say, although the arguments are, are quite established, but the, the mechanism of doing this is reasonably new. So we have a local economic and community plan out to 2021, which will be fundamentally revised against um, uh, all of these uh, 17 um, uh, SDGs. 
uh, and it is uh, the revision of that starts this year for adoption of a new plan next year. We have the city development plan, which I mentioned earlier. That goes into a formal review period at the end of this year as well, and the successor um, plan, which will run out to about 2031, will be fundamental in the delivery of a number of key issues around compact growth and sustainable development. And it's very important as well to note that we have a statutory climate action plan in terms of key targets around carbon, uh, carbon reduction, uh, energy efficiency, thermal improvement in housing and heating systems, uh, transition towards low carbon and energy use, uh, circular economy uh, issues as well that are attached to that. So at the moment, across those three plans, we, we've made an assessment, um, not as scientific as I'd prefer, but I think we can go at it again and again and become more refined. But in that initial assessment, we're confident about saying that we have a high contribution uh, across the top line there towards those strategic development goals uh, that are, are, are noted, and the lower contribution um, ones are noted as well. And we want to move all of our uh, plans towards a, a, a position where we're able to say there may be a high contribution towards these SDGs. So that's one of the matters that's beginning to allow us to increase our coherence, and particularly around the issue of um, sustainable cities and infrastructure and community development. Okay, so let's move on. So now I'm going to talk about the particular matter of brownfield sites in Dublin. So uh, if you just bear with me here, what you're looking at is not the highest resolution map you'll have ever seen of Dublin. It's looking at the distribution of lands that are zoned in particular categories of land use. Norm nominally, the, the, the term is Z6, zone 6. Um, so you know, that zone is uh, characterized as a land use that provides for the creation and protection of enterprise and to facilitate opportunities for employment creation. So the land use patterns usually established within that zone are major uh, warehousing and distribution services across a whole range of different industries, including agribusiness, uh, including um, automobile and energy distribution, um, including um, sports and amenities, because a lot of people uh, um, um, use large gyms and so forth. So there's, there's a range of different uh, services all about uh, work, about employment uh, and about enterprise attached to these land uses. Um, but they are legacy land use zonings that go back 20, 30, 40 years in some cases. Um, and they're not as coherent, sorry, they're not as integrated, should I say, with the um, public land use uh, system, the public transport system and the modality shift that's required to improve public transport. Um, so we've, we've undertaken a, a, a series of reviews um, to consider how we might re rezone some of this land. And with the main emphasis being on the development of housing and the, meeting the housing need of the city in order to ensure sustainable and compact growth, there was a review of 82 different land banking areas across the city. They're all illustrated there uh, in a purplish pink color. Out of that 82 sites, we ended up with approximately uh, 20 small to medium sized land banks that were identified and those land banks are going forward for a proposed rezoning by way of a variation in our city development plan and that's an ongoing discussion with the elected representatives um, uh, in, in the city and decisions will be required this year certainly before quarter four 2020 when our development plan review which I mentioned earlier will undertake will be undertaken overall. Um, so, so the main thing you're seeing there is an identification of land which has quite a lot of vacant and underutilized space, actually. Uh, large warehouses, some of which are empty, uh, because a, a, a considerable amount of distribution has moved outside of the congested city area inside the M50. Uh, and uh, the context on the left is, is the confirmation of where the city sits in terms of its current provision for housing and residential development. So at present, we have 120 hectares of land zoned and suitable for residential development distributed across the city. But the majority of that land is already involved in some form of development in the current pipeline, either at design stage or actually construction. Um, and we do have a major challenge around how we secure residential land use in order to improve sustainable development on the growth strategy that's been identified for the city. So as I mentioned, this review undertaken from last year and ongoing this year is identifying those industrial lands for potential recategorization 
underneath our next city development plan. And some of these lands are being identified for redesignation today, this year, ahead of any formal revision of the plan. About 45% of those Z6 lands are very large sites. Um, you know, around about 272 hectares of land is involved and each one of those sites will need its own framework plan and each of those framework plans will have to integrate uh, a number of different planning objectives around the large-scale regeneration of the area based on the provision of housing and employment so one of the major uh, challenges here is, is getting greater integration and coherence between places of work and places of residence so that we're not um, engaging uh, uh, people in in the challenge of long-term or indeed increasing um, uh, private car use and, and congestion and the various challenges economically and socially that arise from that. And, and Dublin, although you wouldn't know it today because of the, the, the actual current lockdown, Dublin's a highly congested city and, and you know, it can at times almost come to a, a standstill, um, but we won't go into that just yet. Uh, so we will be making a number of recommendations throughout this year for, for changes. So I'm going to look at a few of these in, in particular, just to give you a flavour, so if you wouldn't move, mind moving on there, Anthony. And mm -hmm. um, so the next slide, we'll, we'll just introduce uh, some of the larger sites that we were, we are looking at, and um, there's an aerial shot of each of them, and they're, they're marked out in more particular detail on, on maps, which I can um, I can send on if you wish. So, for example, the first one is an industrial estate which comprises a, a significant amount of warehousing and distribution services uh, on the north of the city. And it has a very substantive um, set of connections to the city via good cycling and walking connections. And it also has a public uh, light rail, or we call it Lewis, uh, and also a heavy rail commuter service within the context of its environs. Uh, but its particular challenge here for the city is the fragmentation of the ownership of these units and these land sites. So we have a number of buildings which are owned by separate individuals and the buildings sit on land parcels which are again owned by separate individuals and a lot of the challenge here is in the assembly of the site and the coherence of those um, uh, site uh, units towards any future rezoning and our challenge there uh, in particular is to avoid any undue speculation and flipping of sites in anticipation that rezoning will make the land more valuable as it will be transferred from an empty warehouse built 20 or 40 years ago uh, into new forms of um, highly designed um, thermally efficient uh, adaptable uh, housing um, so there is a, a particular challenge there to try and avoid in, indeed on all of the sites we're looking at any undue speculation in this particular area, we have a challenge around water management and the protection of the adjoining water bodies, a particular river called the Tolka, and also the Royal Canal, which runs from the north inner city out towards the River Shannon, all the way to the west of Ireland. Um, we have a number of challenges around community and educational facilities in the area, and part of the area is, is subject to a, a number of challenges around area deprivation and a long-term unemployment. Uh, and one of the challenges in, in maintaining the space is its mixed use. The fact is that it is an area of employment and significant employment locally. So another great challenge here is not only to avoid market speculation based on an anticipation and land use change, but also very importantly, maintaining employment in an area uh, as it undergoes transition. Uh, any proposed transition for the future land use has to include an employment strategy that does not displace work from an area which is not always as affluent as others in the city. So these, these issues would be actually common across all of these lands. Um, the, the next issue again on the north side of the city is the Fingless Business Centre at Jamestown Business Park. This has more challenges around vacancy and underutilisation and that relates to the fact that although it's close to an urban centre called Fingless, which is a village area, an urban village area within the city of Dublin, it doesn't have the same connectivity in terms of public transport. Um, it also has a whole host of overland infrastructure to do with energy distribution and uh, electricity pylons. Um, but uh, it, it has um, potential, certainly in terms of uh, the, the, the land use rezoning being more effective and, and more, more speedily achieved because it, it, it doesn't actually have the same level of um, entrepreneurial or employment attached to it. Um, Moving on, uh, Malahide Road, Oscar Trainer Lands, here's one that is really quite a challenge because it's subject to a lot of expectation. There's a primary um, 
uh, service in, in form of Beaumont Hospital, which is uh, our leading transplant surgery hospital in, in the country, which is located in the area, and a massive demand for um, housing and affordable housing in the area as a result of that employment. There's a lot of mixed use um, re requirement in the area, a lot of retail area, but again, a substantial amount of available along one of the arterial routes. It does have a higher form of connectivity in terms of um, the public bus service, and it has a, 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 a it's co-located, it's, it's significantly co-located with a major area that's undergoing development around um, Belmain and Belcamp, and that's a, known as the northern fringe of the city, which is undergoing a housing led development and the challenge here has been more about trying to ensure uh, a sustainable and balanced form of development that maintains the key employment in the local area uh, and that improves overall the opportunity for housing provision finally uh, the one that's probably the most obvious opportunity for the city at the moment is the uh, roads to the west of the city called this road <coughs> which runs out along an ancient Schliedal, an ancient route out to the west of the country. But it, it sits, uh, this, this particular site sits alongside a whole host of different infrastructures cutting through large area of residential space. Um, it's a very large site which runs along the Grand Canal, generally speaking, and moves towards um, the west side of, this, of the city. Um, adjacent to other local authority areas, there are very significant issues terms of you know the basic utilities required in terms of water and, and the provision of other uh, child, uh, other services there's some changes around <clears throat> flooding and, and, and water surface management um, but it is going to be, and it already has a, a, a public um, transport service in Duluth and it is going to be an area where new infrastructure will be identified for for uh, transport and it is probably the most uh, immediately obvious area for a land use running that could quite particularly produce a large amount of, of, of housing provision. So common to all of these areas really are, are the needs to try and balance the overarching strategic objectives of compact growth and sustainable development while not interrupting significantly those areas of employment and maintaining a cohesion and an integration within the community. And this is really it is quite a challenge. Of course, it, it refers back to the opportunity to develop space and, and, and to make decisions around these spaces. So if you wouldn't mind moving on, Anthony. Um, so part of that is being able to bring an evidence base forward. Um, and one of the things that the uh, the city has developed that I've been leading on in the city um, is the production of a housing data navigator. So I have got time to go into this, but there's a link there on the top of that presentation to an online website, which gives you an interactive uh, geospatial uh, mapping system which gives a whole set of data uh, arranged around a series of data themes from the administrative and contextual layers of the geographies you're looking at, right down to the land use zoning and the planning applications on that land, uh, and to a number of other uh, details around dwelling completions and developments, details around the uh, findings of the census and so forth. All of this information is expressed visually through a uh, online ArcGIS system, and it's a, a, um, it's a data navigator that's, that I'm developing in, in, in cooperation with Ordnance Survey Ireland and with the All Ireland Research Observatory at Maynooth. So, if you wouldn't, if you bear with me, I'll just show you some screen grabs from some of the maps that you can uh, interact with. Um, if you wouldn't mind moving on, please, Anthony. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you could just perhaps go back up one. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Uh, we, we have, okay, <laughs> back down one, please. Uh, so, uh, I'm seeing hold it there. Hive. Yeah, that's it. Hold it there, Anthony. Thank you so much. Okay. So this is a screen grab from the distribution of every sale of property in quarter 2019. We have taken all of the uh, registered property sales for residential property from the property price registrar. We have geocoded the data and we've expressed it specially. Um, you go on to the website for this um, uh, data navigator, you click into the um, system, and on the left hand side, you use a directory driven uh, service. So if you click into the details of data on the rental market, sales, and property valuations, you then go into uh, another box. You click for the property price register data from 2016, which is when the property price. Register starts in Ireland. Some of you might be quite surprised by that one. Um, 
you go into the data for quarter one 2019 and then you select the sales values for all of the sales in quarter one 2019 up they pop on the screen uh, and then you're able to hover your cursor over anyone you're interested in click on it and up pops that information box and it tells you the price and the location by address and unfortunately that's all it tells you because our property price register does not have yet the spectrum of data that you might otherwise want in terms of actual the space of the building, the size in terms of meters squared, the uh, energy efficiency of the building, even the age of the building. There's a lot of information missing. So that's one of the reasons why the data navigator has become quite important, um, because we're trying to integrate all of this data into a, a system that allows for better decision making. However, it's the first time it's expressing the actual distribution of residential uh, land, I'm sorry, residential sales and of course the, the land values in the area are reflective of the high residential values too uh, and you can at a glance you can see that distribution across the city um, so uh, if you could move on please Anthony um, we're also able to look at information on the uh, completions and the new dwellings and this is a very quick illustration of how there's a continued rate of sprawl in the city of Dublin and the, in the greater Dublin region which is very much in contrast to the uh, perspectives of the national planning framework. What you're looking at there is the new dwelling completions data from our central statistics office, which has developed a new and coherent and methodologically sound uh, assessment of new dwelling completions. And you're looking at data there for the period from 2012 to uh, 2018, over that uh, six year period, looking at all of the data completion. Now, this is a period of significant austerity um, in in Irish society and economy and the the collapse in investment in new housing provision particularly state-led investment is very very significant uh, and it's one of the reasons why we have such a chronic supply side shortage but for the new housing that was provided over that period the vast majority of it was ex-urban it was outside of the major com compact urban areas uh, again you can go in there and you can look at the distribution of those completions against what's known as the um, air code routing key, which is a geography that allows us to identify particular quadrants of the city in terms of their housing provision. Um, if you go on to the next slide, please, Anthony, the data then you're looking at here in the next slide is data on tenure patterns. For example, you can go into the uh, data we hold on all of the Irish census. The last Irish census was 2016, the next one is 2021. We have a sensor intercensal period of five years, um, and we rely on the census data for a huge amount of information. A lot of all of it of, uh, in terms of housing, there's about 700 variables in relation to housing um, and place that we've we've mapped here. Um, and we're looking here at the percentage of private rented um, and the distribution of private rented uh, tenancies in 2016. And you can see the darker the color, the higher the concentration. And you can look at the, the distribution of this tenure within uh, the city environs. And that's particularly important because the uh, growth strategy around housing investment over the past four or five years has been on build to rent for the private rental market. And indeed, it's the dominant form of housing provision uh, over the last three or four years. Uh, it hasn't yet impacted on uh, any kind of uh, rental values. Rents in Dublin are particularly high as well. Uh, but it helps us understand where uh, the aggregate uh, supply of rental is and what might be affecting land use uh, values in that area as well. And you might see that some of those patterns of uh, lighter colored um, distribution for private rental um, uh, in the south, if you look to the southwest of the map, you'll see that there isn't a huge amount of private rental there. That's one of the uh, areas we were looking at earlier, that that Nace Road area that I mentioned with all of the industrial lands, with the warehousing lands, that might yet be converted, uh, some of it into uh, residential land use. Uh, so we'd expect to see patterns of, uh, of um, tenure changing over time if that was to come forward. Um, the next slide shows you at a, a higher glance, the uh, the changes in, in values in, in rents, for example, we're able to track the number of quarters where rent increases have been greater than 7% in the city. Uh, this is really important data because we actually have rent stabilization policies which limited, limit the annual uh, rate of inflation to 4%. And there's a real question about their effectiveness uh, when we're able to demonstrate that over a great period uh, of time, a substantial period of time, 
all of the uh, the areas marked red in particular have had a uh, increase in their rental values of uh, 7% at least, if not higher in certain areas. Finally, the next slide, just as an example, allows you to interrogate some matters of who owns the properties that are in, in rental. So we have data from the Residential Tenancies Board in terms of the ownership structure of um, the uh, rental unit. Uh, now, at the moment, the majority of rental uh, units in Dublin still remain um, uh, owned by the kind of mom and pop landlord, you might argue, uh, they could be called that, uh, uh, single individuals uh, owning maybe one or two properties. But there is a very substantive and accelerating change towards more institutional ownership via private equity investment through uh, real estate investment trusts and various other forms of um, financial vehicles that have come into the Dublin market in particular. Uh, and they're producing some notable impacts on the local uh, pricing strategies for rents in particular areas. So what you're seeing here is the distribution of uh, the company-owned tenancies in particular areas of the city. Um, and as you can see in the one that's highlighted in that area, of the North Docklands uh, of the city, where there's 1,552 tenancies registered in June 2014. 485 of those tenancies are owned by uh, a company lander of some form. And that just helps us illustrate some of the changes that are underway in, in the finance and the ownership and the investment patterns in, in the rental, rental system. So what I'm doing here is I'm demonstrating the need Need to be able to bring this data to bear into the evidence uh, evidence space, uh, the, the, the data informing your intelligence, the intelligence helping consolidate your knowledge, and on the basis of that knowledge, you're, you're producing an evidence based argument or decision making towards obtaining your objectives. And if it was always that simple, it would be a wonderful thing. There's plenty of contest around this, of course, but the evidence will speak for itself, and I think it's really important for us to remember the importance of investing in in good quality. Uh, geo analytics and uh, data analytics and data ecology and, and this is something that's a very important matter uh, for decision makers. So finally, if you mind Anthony, the last slide uh, brings me back to some of the matters I wanted to uh, uh, sign off with, which was how we are proceeding with uh, our attempts to develop new urban space and to renew uh, spaces that were formerly used for other functions. Uh, and also to redevelop uh, spaces that uh, are vacant. So you're looking at a thematic design for a form of housing provision um, uh, in the Dublin 8 area, which again is to the southwest of the inner city of Dublin. Um, and this area um, is very mixed in terms of economy and uh, income and land use, uh, but it has had a pre uh, concentration of larger scale social housing projects. One in particular, formerly called uh, St. Michael's Estate, um, has been raised to the ground uh, and is, the, uh, is a, a site for future redevelopment, uh, which was parked as a result of the uh, impacts of the economic crisis. Only more recently, in the last two years, have we managed to obtain a political backing for a new form of development in the area. And we're trying to develop a cost rental model uh, housing provision, which effectively means producing a mid-market public rental model for households who are facing some of the very high rental prices in the private market, but also bringing forward a new form of housing provision that attempts to modify some of the very substantive negative feedback, feedback loops that come into your economy when your housing system is very, very uh, unbalanced and when the housing costs are very high. So in this particular site, we'll be building out a minimum of 472 dwellings, with 70% of those being uh, made available on a cost rental mechanism, whereby the tenants will pay economic rent uh, equivalent to the need uh, to the cost of the development and its maintenance and repair. And 140 units will be offered on a social rental tenancy, which is a differential rent, which means uh, that the uh, households in there will be mostly a lower income, sometimes welfare dependent household. Uh, but they will present with a number of other housing needs uh, in, in, in line with their health or their well-being. Uh, we're, we're ensuring that there's a, a mixture of different dwelling types, and we want to ensure a, a balance in terms of the community that emerges here between um, older persons' housing and, and so forth. But what's significant about this site is the, is the 
compact nature of its development and we're introducing a whole series of commercial community recreational leisure and sports facilities into the site including a new public library uh, some supermarket and retail units a high quality civic building um, that the city council will provide services to, a neighborhood park with play facilities and a public plaza are all part of the design objectives improving the mobility the permeability and the connectedness of this space through increased public transport, better cycling provision, better pedestrian routes as well. The objective is a high quality and vibrant mixed use urban quarter. We've got to the point where we're uh, established with our consultative forum and a whole series of stakeholders across enterprise, health, uh, well, community, uh, policing, uh, uh, various other forms of chambers of commerce and so forth, all involved in that. And we have a framework plan which is now completed and has been put out for a consultation and I can send you a link to download that. The next stage that we're in this year is moving towards engaging an overall design team uh, which will comprise architects, quantity surveyors, planners, um, designers, community development, the whole, the whole shebang and moving towards a final master plan which then goes forward to a, a planning stage. So this will be a really good test of how effective we can make the overall strategic objectives of compact growth and sustainable development within the older areas uh, of the city which are uh, in need of, of, of a regeneration model uh, but one that is going to be very particularly focused on attempting to rebalance our quite expensive and our quite uh, challenging uh, housing system uh, so uh, I'll stop there thank you great thanks a lot Dohi um, and thanks to everyone who's spoken today um, I know we went a little bit over, so I apologize for that. But before I sign off completely, I might just see if some people are still, or, uh, some of our speakers are still around. We have a couple of questions here on the left. Um, so maybe I will slip back to Alfredo for a second. I'll just put one question to each speaker before finishing up. So. Um, Al um, Alfredo, there's a question here from uh, Badia um, asking what are the main challenges that you think will face the implementation of the principles that you were talking about in, in Brussels? Um, if you're still there, Alfredo, do you think you could speak to those um, uh, yep, implementation challenges? Yeah, I'm, I'm still there. Uh, Fantastic. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, the challenge. Um, I think that's uh, uh, one part. It's um, uh, of course um, the governance uh, challenge. Uh, as I said, uh, I didn't, I didn't go on it. But th th there is also a part in the strategic plan which uh, um, points out the 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 the, the way uh, or to or to implement it. Uh, that's one part, the governance, uh, because we are one region with 19 municipality. Uh, we have a lot of layers, and and uh, and also, as I said, uh, we also have a, a dialogue with the municipality, a dialogue also with the European Union, which is also an important player. Dialogue with the two regions, as I said, uh, as well, because there are a lot of projects related, for instance, for mobility, um, because we also want to transform a lot of uh, highways in 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, road uh, in um, urban road. Uh, so a lot of dialogue is necessary. Uh, that one challenge that I see, and the the other one is it's to have um, to keep having this compact city. Yeah, or to to have the this uh, um, the dialogue between the density and quality of life, uh, or to keep uh, have some densification, some places maybe in some other places some de densification, mm -hmm. and and uh, in order to keep a quality of, of life, uh, yeah, that uh, that's also uh, main challenge. So the, the governance, uh, the quality of life and mobility okay brilliant and yeah and indeed that becomes i think an especially pressing question at the moment yeah, um, that's, that's, uh... you had a question alfredo for paulina and perhaps this would be the moment um to ask it you were asking about uh, uh, added value 
Yeah. Yes, I had a question related to uh, uh, because we, um, about metropolitan cooperation and governance. If if uh, if uh, if uh, Lina uh, uh, studied the added value of having a metropolitan governance uh, as a um, way to fight urban sprawl. Do you hear that question, Paulina? Yes, I have changed my computer, so now I have a good uh, connection. So thank you very much for this uh, question. Uh, actually, we have this metropolitan uh, governance as a tool uh, in terms of promoting social integration. But in our work package, we have not um, addressed the issue of uh, added value. Although, and I think you have a webinar with these uh, people from uh, Italy, from Rome, that they are in charge of uh, these uh, economic uh, aspects and added value uh, to address uh, this issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. So indeed, we may hear more on that um, in the future. And um, we have what, one question coming on the left about um, financial... To, so this is for Dohi, um, and I think it'll end up being our last question today. Um, Dohi, um, Bernhard Muller from our project, I think, is asking uh, if you have financial, uh, national or regional tools to promote uh, brownfield recovery here in, in, in the Dublin region. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the short answer is yes. Um, we, we do have um, a number of mechanisms uh, attached to fiscal policy arrangements for investment uh, in the development process that results in new residential uh, development particularly. Um, it's not as explicit as saying here is a real site which we want to incentivize through grant funding or a tax designation specific to uh, a housing uh, provision. In fact, it's one of the major debates in the city about how effective our current form of, of planning is in, in delivering the, the, the sustainable development and the inclusive growth. So what we do have are very large strategic housing development areas, large land use, land banking areas, which uh, go straight to a, um, the highest level of planning authority in the country and bypass actually local government in order to affect a speedier decision. And that speedier decision is a requirement that emerges from development interests in order to scale uh, and uh, increase the overall density and, and, and size of their development in particular localities, with the argument being that this increases their viability uh, and maintains the opportunity to improve uh, a, a speedy supply side um, respond to unmet housing need. Um, I think the ev evidence on that is still out, actually. There's certainly a very speedy form of construction and delivery and development once, uh, uh, the, uh, once the investment tap is switched on. But there, uh, there are some substantial issues around um, how particular forms of investment are incentivized under our fiscal policy arrangements. Um, and in particular around the equity-based uh, investment. But this very much relates to, uh, if I may, the unpicking of the impact of the global financial crisis in Dublin through its property market and its property system and its banking system. And we, we still have very substantial challenges where, whereby equity is not as available or is not forthcoming to particular forms of development, development or development interest. And there has been a greater reliance on the international equity markets outside of the Irish banking structure uh, to, bring, to bring investment in. So the short answer is yes, there are fiscal arrangements, there are uh, policy and strategic planning arrangements that have um, uh, tried to reduce the friction costs, as they're sometimes referred to, of development. But on the flip side, there are some serious concerns about the distributive impacts uh, and the overall sustainable uh, development uh, issues that are emerging from, from that type of speedy urbanism. Okay, got it. Interesting. Thank you, Dohi. And we have um, a link sent there from Alfredo on uh, a little bit more information as well that you can check out. Um, I'll be sending the video of this um, out to all of the people who participated and those who signed up but didn't manage to arrive. And I'll already flag 
that we're planning um, a second iteration of land policy because there was a lot of interest um, for it and we didn't get to get uh, everything that we would like to certainly touch on and perhaps we'll even get a, a chance to go in more depth with our speakers of today but let's see if that's um, possible. So thanks again to all the speakers, really really interesting stuff and um, diverse insights but I think definitely a, um, a harmony struck there in terms of what we're thinking of as important, the direction that we need to move in and some of the steps that uh, that we're taking to get there. So. On that hopeful note, um, thanks again to the speakers and thanks to everyone who joined in. All the best. Thank you.